testing. Can you hear me now? There we go. I guess it's just technical difficulties. We're um, this morning. We're having more. This TV and the one back there is not working for some reason. So if you need to look at some, you'll have to look at this TV over here. So we'll get this all straightened out eventually. So anyway, today we are on uh, lesson number seven in your Sunday school book, titled "For Such a Time." For such a time. The focus thought is God has called us to work in the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. Amen. And focus verse is Esther 4 and 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And lesson text is also Esther 2 and 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of vesting. And Esther 4, 13 through 17. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then, there, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade <clears throat> them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to law. And if I perish... I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. And you may be seated. <clears throat> for such a time. So who here today is thankful for those moments that you see God brought along some, someone or something your way at just the right time? For such a time as this. Maybe it, was some, maybe it was when you really needed something. Maybe there was problems. Maybe there was sickness that had come your way. And you were lost. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know how to fix this problem. Maybe first you even tried to fix it yourself. You tried to get your fingers in there. But it didn't work. You, you were defeated on that. You knew it was too hard for you. Then, then the Lord showed up. Then the Lord sent that person at just the right time, with just the right words. At, and in that moment, things started to change. You saw a move in your situation. You knew at that point the Lord was at work. The healing started to come. And you knew it had to be the Lord for such a time as this. The pastor might have preached the message that gave you the strength to continue on. A message that hit you and gave you that aha moment in your life for such a time as this. When those moments come, we get so thankful and so joyful in that moment. God has made a way where there is no other way. You didn't think there was a way, but God made that way. And that is something we should always thank the Lord for. Because God, He has called us to work for Him. Not just the pastor. He didn't just call the pastor. He called us all. He didn't just call the pastor to pray for us and to seek out a message to preach in that time and season that He needed in. He called all of us. We are all here today for such a time as this. God made sure each and every one of you were born and that you were here today for a reason. For a reason. So today, our lesson is on the story of Esther. 
And it is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It shows us how God can move and work through His people to accomplish things for the kingdom of God. And one of the most crazy things about this, about the book of Esther, is that the mention of God is nowhere to be found in the whole book. You can look through there. It never says the word God in there at all. But throughout the whole book, you can see the fingerprints of God. God all over it. You can see God working behind the scenes in His sovereignty to orchestrate events ahead of time. To do, he did stuff ahead of time to work out the protection of his people, the Jews, and for justice against their enemies. So God, he protected Esther from her enemies. And because Esther believed in God, he used her, used her to help save his people from death. So Esther lived in, during the rule of the Persian king. Uh, people say in different ways. I call it a hostiaris. What did you say? A Hazarus. See, different ways. So this was after the time of the prophet Daniel. Um, this was after the time of prophet Daniel that we had um, talked about in the past lessons. Daniel, according to history, died shortly after the, Babylonian, the Babylon fell to Persia. So he was not present during Esther's story. Esther would have been a part of those Jews that didn't return to Judah after the decree of uh, Cyrus saying that Jews could return to their homeland. She was part of the group that stayed, that remained in the Persian city. So the book of Esther, it starts off by talking about the king, how in his third year as king, he put together a big feast, he, um, a big party. And well, if you look at it, it was really just a show off. That's the reason why he did it. He was just showing off. He wanted to show off his riches. He wanted to show off his kingdom. He wanted to show off how great he was. Let everybody look at his worldly power and his worldly fame. But during this party he was throwing, he had, well, a little too much to drink. He had a little too much wine, and he was showing off in front of people. So he decided he was going to call his queen to be brought to him and have her royal crown put on her head. He wanted all of his buddies sitting around uh, to see the beauty of his queen. More showing off. This is when the queen said, nope. She said, nope, I'm not coming. She refused the king's commandment to come. So, of course, this made the king very mad. He was now looking bad in front of all of his buddies that he, that he wanted to show her off in front of. So because of that, a commandment went out that she would no longer hold the position of queen and that it would be given to another. She was no longer allowed to come before the king. So now the king was left with no queen and needed to fill the spot. Esther 2, 1 through 4. After these things, when the wrath of the king, Ahasuerus, was appeased, he remembered Vasi and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, and unto the custody of Haga, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for pur purification be given them, and let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Vasi. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. So with the advice of some of his servants, the king was going to have the very first reality show of The Bachelor. That's what was about to happen there. He was going to get all the young women together from the kingdom and make them compete. Make them compete against each other. See who gets to be the next queen of Persia. What a way to find a wife. <clears throat> so that is when, that's where Esther comes in. She was one of the maidens that were gathered together into the palace. But if you look at it here, from the very beginning, she found favor among those in charge. Esther 2, 8 through 9. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Hege, that, that Esther was brought up, brought, was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. 
and she speedily gave her her things for purification with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens which were meant to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids into the best place of the house of the women. Excuse me. So here Haggai, the keeper of the women, saw something. From the very beginning, he saw something in Esther. And he preferred her among all of the women. She was, so he was good to her. And he gave her the best of everything. And he really wanted to help her out. And you know what? This may not look like much at this point, but it was God having his fingers in this because he knew this needed to happen. He was working ahead of time to make sure something happened. So now when, when it was Esther's turn to go before the king, because Haggai liked her, he gave her some inside information. Esther 2 and 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had been who had taken her for his daughter, was coming to the king. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamber, chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto the king of Hasieras, unto his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the crown, the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vesta. So when Esther went before the king, the king, it said, fell in love with her. The Bible does not tell us why the king loved her. It just said, it could be said it was because of her beauty. But all the other candidates for queen would probably most likely be physically beautiful too. I'm sure he didn't call. Yes, let's just leave it as that. So anyway, they're probably all physically beautiful. It was prob but it was probably more than just beauty that caught his eye. Like, the, like her wisdom she showed by not taking nothing unto her visit with the king except for what the servant told her. Because the servant knew the king. He knew the king better probably than about anybody. So he gave her that inside information. She took only that. So that wisdom, it showed her character to the king. So now here's Esther, was queen. She was now chosen to serve an evil king in a foreign land. Not in the promised land of the Jews. Not around her own people. But now she was going to serve the king of Persia. So we today, as Holy Ghost-filled Christians, are not citizens of this world. We are not citizens of the world. We may have to live in this world, but it is not our homeland. It is not our place of citizenship. In Philippians 3 and 20, here's what Philippians 3 and 20 says. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you, in this verse, the term conversation, if you look it up in the Greek, the word, it means citizenship. It means homeland. So in other words, the verse is saying, but our citizenship is in heaven, from where also we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So first and foremost, our citizenship as Jesus-named Christians is in heaven. Not this world, not the things of this world, or the kingdom of this world, it is of heaven. So that means our talk. That means our walk. That means our life should be that of a citizen of heaven. Not to be conformed to this world, but have our minds on the things of heaven. Have our minds on the things of God. To walk the way God would have us walk. To talk and live the life God would have us live. Because that is where we're a citizen of. Let the world be the world. Just give Jesus to the world while we are here. That is what we are called to do. Our homeland is not of this land. We might live in a foreign land today, but praise the Lord, we do not have to serve an evil king. Mm. We serve the righteous king. We serve the king of kings. We serve the Lord of lords. Sometimes we forget that we are servants of the king, that we live for Jesus Sometimes we think the church and even God just exists for us. But true joy, peace, and contentment are found when we realize we are His servants. When we realize we are servants of God. Romans 6, 15-23. through 23. 
What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Mm. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the matter of men because of the firmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were servants of sins, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things, pastor said at the beginning, it's, or Sister Judy, it is death. For now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the only way you can have eternal life. Sin will destroy you. So Paul here is telling us that people will be servants of something. He said you'll be a servant of something. We can either be servants of sin and end up with nothing but physical and spiritual death. Or servants to righteousness will bring us holiness and life everlasting with Jesus. Esther, she may not have had much of a choice in whom to serve. But us today, we have a choice. We can choose the world or we can choose Jesus. And the world, I'm telling you, may look good for a moment. It may seem like you're getting somewhere great for a certain season. But eventually, I promise you, the devil, he will yank that rug right out from underneath you. And you will see that your wages of sin are death. It will not be worth it in the end. So choose Jesus today, church. Choose everlasting life through Jesus. So Esther, she chose to serve God by obeying her uncle Mordecai and submitting to the king's rule. And because of that, she was blessed. We too are blessed when we obey godly elders and leaders that God puts in our life. <clears throat> I know this is something that most people don't like to hear. You usually don't hear very many shouts when you talk about obedience and submission. The flesh is not like that. The devil pushes the agenda of be yourself. Do what you want to do. But obedience and submission are biblical principles. God calls his people to obey the word of God and to submit to its authority. Submission is obeying to God's word when the flesh does not want to obey. Submission is following God and his word even though the outcome does not seem clear from their own human minds. Submission is obeying God's word even when the world all around you is doing the complete opposite. We obey the word by doing what the Bible says is right and not what the world is telling us. We obey the word of God by listening and putting into action the word that our pastor preaches to us. That is the anointed word of God that is given to help us. It is given in that season that God wants it to be. He gives it at that season so it will help his people. So I know we don't like to hear it, but blessings come through obedience to God. Comes through obedience to his word. That's where your blessings come from. <clears throat> So back to Esther. Once she becomes queen, something happens. A man named Haman gets promoted by the king. He gets put above all the princes. Esther 3, 1 through 6. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamada, the Agonite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gates bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning it. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? 
Now it came to pass when they spake daily to him that he hearkened not unto them. Then that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told him that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw Mordecai bowed not, nor did it reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hosiris, even the people of Mordecai. <coughs> so here Mordecai, he refused to bow to Haman. The Bible does not say why he refused, but we can take it as the same reason that we saw the three Hebrew boys did not bow before the statue. Because they knew they only bowed to one, and that was to God and Him alone. So it shows us that even though it doesn't say the word God in Esther, Mordecai must have stayed faithful to God and his beliefs. And that led him straight to the center of attention. Haman was now plotting to kill all the Jews because he was mad. Kill all these people because he was mad. One man didn't bow to him. Because Haman refused the respect from Mordecai. That might seem like just a small thing, but to somebody like Haman, it was not small. He wanted to receive reverence, and he was willing to kill for it. And that's so true for God's people today. The enemy, the devil, and the world, it seeks worship. It does seek worship. And sometimes it will settle for God's people just not giving God all the worship he deserves. But in the end, the ultimate goal of the enemy is to get God's people, his people, to swear allegiance to him. To get God's people to change that citizenship from heaven to the world. To change their homeland from there to the world. That is when we must be like Mordecai. And even though we're in a strange land, this is not our land like we talked about. Even when we're a strange land, or we might be around other people that don't live like we live and don't support us, we must take a stand to worship God and worship Him alone no matter what. We must make up in our minds that Jesus is the only one that we are going to serve and that we are citizens of heaven and we're only servants of God and not servants of this world. Because Esther, it's all about God's people being delivered from their enemies. But the battle that is talked about in Esther began when one man, it all began when one man refused to bow. Just one man started it all. One person in here today can ha make something happen. One person. Just if the church... Church, let me tell you this. The worship, your worship matters to God. We might think of ourselves sometimes as small, sometimes as insignificant, but that is not true. Your worship alone can help you win battles. Your worship alone can help you defeat the enemy. So let, let me read you this real quick. Let me read you what happened to Paul and Silas. Acts 16, 23 through 26. And when they had laid many stripes upon them and cast them in the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who have receiving such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises. They worshiped unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. Praise and worship broke the chains. Praise and worship opened up prison doors. You have power in your praise. You have power through your worship. If you need something from God today, if things are going bad for you, if you don't see any way out of the problem or situation that you're in, then praise Jesus. Worship Jesus. Lift up some praise. Do a little jumping. Do a little shouting for Jesus. Do a little worship to the King. Do a little worship. Get God's attention, and you'll see those chains start to fall off. See God move through worship. It is your weapon given to you to defeat the enemy. So use it today. Use that weapon that was given to, unto you. The Sunday School book, it had a story in it that I thought was very good. I want to read it here. It said, once long ago, there was a poor beggar in a far country. He sat each day on the corner begging for rice. One day, an assuming stranger passed by and asked the beggar for a piece 
of the rice he had received that morning. The beggar consented, realizing that all he possessed had been given to him. Later in the day, the same scenario occurred again. This time, the beggar reluctantly consented. Finally, near the end of the day, the stranger appeared again and once more asked for rice. The beggar at this point was annoyed. How can I survive if I continue to give you all the rights I have collected? The stranger smiled and asked the beggar if he had even checked the bowl from this morning. Pulling the bowl down off the ledge, he peered in and was stunned by what he saw. For every grain of rice that the stranger had taken, in its place he had left a diamond. He left a diamond. That is just like our praise to God. We give praise to God and in return, he gives us much. Much, much more than we give up. That beggar gave up a grain of rice for a diamond. Every time we just give a little bit of praise, we get a lot more back in return. A lot more back in return. It is always, always, always going to be worth it to give your praise to God. Always worth it. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And that's what Mordecai, he did that day. Mordecai didn't give his praise to Haman, who didn't deserve it. But he saved it for God and God alone. And because of that, a problem came. But God had already made a way of escape. God had already made a way of escape because he saved his praise. God put in more than what was given. Always in the end of the matter, God gives more than what we give. For just a little bit of praise... We get so much. <clears throat> so Esther now faced a challenge. Mordecai's choice not to bow set off a series of events that led Haman to use his position with the king to get a decree set so that the Jews would be killed that was in all the lands of Persia. Once Mordecai heard of that decree, he got in the sackcloth and ashes, and it says he mourned because of what would befall the people of God. Esther might have thought since she was queen, this harm wouldn't come to her, and maybe she could save her family through it. But Mordecai challenged her thinking of self-preservation. If she didn't take a stand to help her people, Esther 4, 13 through 14. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house, more than all the Jews, for if thou altogether holdeth thy peace at this time, then there shall then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai let her know that even though she was queen, even though you may sit in the king's house, even though you think you are safe in these church walls, it will not help you in the end. That no matter what, God's people will be delivered. His people will be delivered. But he said, Esther, if you don't step up to the plate, then you and your family may not make it through this. Then he gives the words we have heard so much. And who knoweth whether thou come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows if the plan, what the plan was from the beginning. Was it just a coincidence that Queen Vashti didn't come to the king when she was called? Was it just coincidence that the servant to the king liked Esther above all the other women? Was it just coincidence that the king fell in love with Esther when he saw her? Or was it all for this moment in time? Was it because God saw something coming down the road? God knew the enemy was sitting there at the door ready to come in. And he set up some events to make sure Esther was at that right place at the right time to help out the people of God. God's hand was at work in the situation. He could have saved his people using other methods besides Esther. But in God's sovereignty, he chose this method. Esther's selection by the king was all part of God's plan. So why are you here today in this building listening to this message? Is it just coincidence or is it for such a time as this? Maybe God has something for you here today. Maybe your prayer is going to get answered today. Maybe your body, Sister Tracy, is going to be healed today. Maybe your body will be healed today. 
Maybe that today is the day that your burden that you've been carrying around, you're going to finally lay it down here at the altar and let God take control. Maybe today is today. Maybe today is the day that somebody is filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Maybe today is that day for such a time as this. Maybe today is the day God set up this moment maybe just for you today. This could be your day. So don't leave here today until you know you've got what God planned for you today. Lift up your praise in this place today to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. Get God's attention today and praise. As the pastor preached last week, when he comes by, constrain him with your praise. Constrain him with your worship. Make sure you get a hold of God today because today could be the day. You don't know if, and you won't know if today is the day if you don't do what Esther did. And you stand up and see what happens. Because she said what? If I perish, I perish. But she said no matter what, I'm going before the king. I'm taking the matter before the king. Today, are you going to take the matter before the king of kings? The Lord of lords while you're here in the building today. We can get the king's attention today. We may not know what happens, but we can get his attention. We can get his attention through some praise and worship and take our matter to him and see what happens today. Take your matter to the king today. Take it to the king. Yes, Lord. Oh, Yes, Jesus. Because Esther, she went before the king. She knew it could mean the end of her life if the king didn't hold forth his scepter to her, but she prepared herself for battle. She didn't just walk right in there. She prepared herself for battle. She prayed and she fasted. She had Mordecai and the other Jews pray and fast. She didn't just go right on in. She prepared first. She made sure God was on her side. She got the strength she needed through prayer and fasting. So church, that should be our example today. That should be an example to us. Before you go into anything in your life, any problems going on, get down, pray. Do a little fasting. Don't go into battle with the devil until you charge yourself up with the power of God. Get that strength inside of you that only comes through prayer and fasting. Don't go unprepared. Get prepared today. And the best way to prepare is do it ahead of time. Before the problem comes, have your prayer life and your fasting together so when the problem comes, you're already prepared for the battle that's at hand. Because Esther, because of her faith, prayer and fasting got the approval of the king. She asked the king that Haman, at Haman to come to the banquet she had prepared. At the banquet, she didn't tell the king what she wanted, but asked if they'd come back to a second one. That night, the king couldn't sleep. He had all this on his mind, and he couldn't sleep. So he got his servants to read him the records of the kingdom. It was in those records that he heard about the story of the man who saved his life from an assassination plot. But he saw this man was never rewarded. That man was Mordecai. God had already set this up. He made sure the king was so disturbed that he couldn't sleep, that he got his mind on this stuff. And the king wanted to honor Mordecai for his service. So in a series of events, it led to Haman, the one who hated Mordecai, to have to be the one to put the honor on Mordecai, which made Haman so mad that it says he built gallows outside of his home to hang Mordecai on. Then Haman and the king went to the second banquet with Queen Esther. That is where she told the king of the danger to herself and to her people. The king, he got so angry at this. He, who would even set this up? Who would do this to this queen? And that's when he found out it was Haman. He got so mad at him, he wanted Haman hanged for it. Because Esther stepped out in faith in God, God rewarded her. God rewarded her because of her faith. She got to help save not just Mordecai, but all of her people. And the enemy, the very enemy, Haman, not only died, but he was hung on the very same gallows that he built for Mordecai. Because there is no better action, church, than to trust God to fulfill his word, to fulfill his promise. We can put our trust in God to do that. He will fulfill his promises. Then Mordecai, who was marked for death, ended up being exalted in the kingdom. The one 
who was marked for death, the one that was going to die, was now exalted. Now he was set above. He got to run Haman's place. He was given all of Haman's property. All this was given to him. And Haman, who didn't live for God, who didn't live for the Lord, he was executed. God deserves to be trusted. We can put our trust in God. Church, I know I've said it already, but just like Esther finding herself at just the right time, at the right place, at the right time, we must believe that God has put us where we belong for such a time as this. we got to believe that we're here today for such a time as this. You don't know what is about to come your way. We don't know what's about to come down the road. But if we put our trust in the Lord, we know He will work it out. You would have never thought, maybe God set you here today to work some, to help somebody else out in a way that you never thought was possible. You're here for that moment today. It might not show forth in that very same way that Esther, saving all the people. It may not be that glorious, but maybe God has you here today. Maybe you come to church each and every Sunday, being faithful each and every Sunday, even when you feel bad. You being faithful each and every Sunday is to help out one person. That one person sees that you stand in faith. Even in this world that's difficult and full of trying times, it sees that each and every Sunday you still come in here. The world may be beating down on you, but you still come in here. And that one person, because of that light that you're shining, there may be a person that's on the edge, about ready to fall out of church, and they see you. They see that you stood faithful, no matter what comes your way, and it gives them the strength to stand. It gives them that strength to stand, to continue coming back. That's what type of blessing we can have to other people. God has put us here for such a time as this. We are here for a reason, church. And don't miss out on what God has for you here today. Like I said, He could have something here today. He could have set up this service here today just for you. Don't miss out on that opportunity. Do not miss out on this, that opportunity. Leave this place today knowing that you got exactly, exactly what God planned for you to have today. Exactly what God wants you to have today. And I'm almost completely out of my notes and the kids are not back there. I guess I rushed right on through this thing. But God has you here for a reason today, church. So look for that reason. Look, look for what God has for you because he truly does love us. He truly sets up opportunities way ahead of time before Esther even needed to save his people. Years ahead of time, he put things in the place. He may be putting you here today. You may think that you have no purpose here today, but he could be setting it up so that you can be that person that helps somebody, that saves somebody on down the road. So don't give up today. Don't give up, but learn. Live for God. Give him all your praise and worship and see what he has for you today. God bless you all.
nothing good have I done to deserve God's own son. I'm not worthy of the snail scars in his hand. Yet he shows the way to Calvary to Brian I stand. He loves me, I don't understand. Oh, oh, oh back the curtain of memory now and then. Lord, show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Yeah. 
go marching in. Go win the saints, go marching in. Oh Lord, I want to be in that number. Win the saints, go marching
here. Sorry about that. Turn me down just a little bit, fellas. Turn me down there just a hair bit. Praise the Lord so much. Thank God so much that we do serve the mighty God this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, Thomas preached this morning, talked this morning about a, such a time as this, and, and, and it touched on so much about things about what my message is going to be on this. It's a Talking about a time, a, a, a period of time, and this morning my message is talking about a, a period of time in our lives and stuff. And um, I just thank God that we're here this morning, that we're here in God's midst. And as Thomas said, that He brought us here this morning. He brought us here for for this time. And you have to think that God brought us these messages for for a reason. Each time that we hear a message, each time we hear a message from the Lord, it has to be for a reason. It's for our purposes. It's for us to. Um, uh, it's for us to bring it forth to you and it's for us to apply the word to our hearts and to our minds and to our souls and, and, and I read a thing where it said that the minister's job is to prepare the people's hearts for the Lord we're to prepare the way for the Lord we're to prepare the message is to prepare the way for the Lord and it's how you respond to it is whether the Lord's going to come into your life or not it's going to and how you respond to the word of God is, what, is what's going to say whether God is going to move in your life if you have your Bibles this morning if you would turn to Acts chapter 10 and then Jeremiah 29 as well <clears throat> Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 6 and then Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, Acts chapter 10, 1 through 6. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, when Cornelius looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou ought to do. And then Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. God knows the thoughts that he has about us, towards us. They're thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected, not an accident, not just haphazard, not just something that just happens. God, his thoughts toward us are peace and not evil so that he can give us an, ex an end that he expects us to go to, an end that he expects us to go towards. This morning I want to speak just a few moments about an expected 
in. Pastor, if you would pray, please. God, let the message. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We honor you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Praise you, Lord Jesus, God. I praise you. Thank you, Jesus, God. We praise you, Lord Jesus, God. We honor you. Thomas said you just you praise him, God. It's like putting diamonds. He's gonna give you back diamonds. I don't know why you wouldn't want to praise him. I don't know why people wouldn't want to praise him if you thought all I got to do is offer up a little bit of praise and God just returns it tenfold and twentyfold and a hundredfold. Why would you not want to clap? Why would you not want to lift up your heart with your hands to him? Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, God, coming to our presence today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. An expected end for such a time as this. That's, that goes. That rolls really good there with Thomas lesson. Uh, this this past year plus, there's a lot of things that we missed out on each other's lives. There's a lot of things that happened in each other's lives that we we missed out on things that happened to each of us and happened. To our kids, and we had three kids that grew up in our church that got married. And I'm not sure that we've ever had that many kids that grew up in the church that got married in such a short span of time, in less than a year and a half, way less than a year and a half. When was the first one was Joseph, right? And he was June, and then Heather got so within a year, we had three kids that grew up in the church that got married: Josh and Joseph and, and Heather. And for Heather. Many of you had only seen Joseph, if you've seen him here at the church that one time he came, you'd only seen him one time. You'd only seen him that one time. And to me, that's just weird because for Heather, church was such, is, not was, is such an important part to her life and her church family is a big part of her, her life. And, and the biggest thing that you missed out on in the whole, is the story of the year and a half or whatever it was between Joseph and Heather was the story of how they met. The story, it wasn't The Bachelor, as Thomas talked about. It was a much better way of, of, coming, of, of, of meeting a husband or meeting a wife. And uh, How did Heather, a shy girl that, that was going to school in college in Radford, meet up with Joseph, who was working in Johnson City as a security guard um, for a hospital? How in the world did these two people, and then meet them in the middle of COVID? When you're not, we wasn't going anywhere, he wasn't going anywhere, anybody, nobody was traveling, you couldn't go out to eat, you couldn't do so many different things, things, and you think, how in the world did this happen? And a little bit of blame, if you want to call blame, falls on blame, just a little, just a little bit of the blame. Heather was never a girl that liked to date, never wanted to date a bunch of different guys, who, and um, she never wanted to, to uh find, you know, go out and just date a bunch of guys and see who she liked. She always felt that that was a waste of her time. She's like, I don't want to waste my time looking around a bunch of guys. I want to find Mr. Wright. That's the person I want. I want him to come, and I want that to be the only person that I date. And I know we think about that. Well, you know, you got to try. It's like going out to eat in the buffet. You got to go see if you like this and see if you like, well, I like a little bit of salad. And I like that. And that's in our minds. But for God, nothing's impossible. If you leave it up to God, if you allow it to ride in the hands of God, you don't, nothing is far-fetched. Nothing is absolute, absurd. When you allow God to have control of it, God can take control of it. And so Heather had guys that she liked and guys that liked her, but nothing would ever become of it. And 
And she wanted someone that had the same beliefs that she did, that had the same desire to work in the church, someone that loved the Lord, somebody that lived the Lord, somebody that was involved in church, somebody that worshiped like she did. And there's just not a lot of people that fit that description. You've seen Heather sing, you've seen her worship, you see how she is and how she lives her life. She always lived a life before the Lord. And so these are, are hard to come by. And there was times that she would get down and she would worry about one day finding Mr. Wright and, and she would be sad or you could, all, I, I'm always one that keeps track of my kids' feelings and when I see something different about them, okay, what's going on? I set them down, I'll, I don't allow that stuff to fester. I want to know if there's a difference in their life, if there's something going on, I want to know what it is. I want to be able to help them. I want to stay in tune with my kid's life. I want to know what's going on. And I would say, you know, what's, you know, what's happening, what's going on, you know, and we would talk about it. And, and I would say, pray, and I would say, trust the Lord. And I, what about Joseph? What about Josh? What about them cast boys, Heather? They come from good family. They're hard workers. They're worshipers. They're, they're faithful to the Lord. And she'd go, ooh, Dad, they're like my brothers. She said, I'm too close to them. There's no way. And I was like, whatever, okay? <laughs> I don't know if y'all have ever seen, noticed this or not. I don't know of too many couples that have come out of the church. For people that actually grew up in the church, that actually grew into the church, that actually got married to each other. I don't know of very, there's very few. If, I, I can't really put my fingers on any, if I know of any, of kids that actually grew up in the church. Why God does that? Why it's been like that? I don't have no idea. But maybe it's something where you need to hook these boys and girls up together. I don't know. But anyway, that's the way God handled it. Maybe we should stay out of it. But she would say, and I would say, whatever. So then one day we're talking, and I said, Heather, why don't you try one of those Christian dating sites? And you're like, what? <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you that had to be the Lord because that had to be the Holy Ghost speaking through me because if I was really in my right mind, if I was in my right mind as a mind of an overprotective dad, there's no way I'm saying anything even resembling that. She had had a friend that was in Canada that she'd met online, and she wanted to go. His family was vacationing in Williamsburg, and they were going to go, go to Bush Gardens. So Heather wanted to go to Bush Gardens to meet him. I'm like, Heather, well, you, don't even, you don't even know that. I can't find him on the Internet. I can't find his dad anywhere on the Internet. Who are these people? <laughs> well, Dad, we've been friends. Well, and I talked to him, saw him on a video. We did a video call, and blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, but Nick's going with you, and I know Nick's very intimidating looking. <laughs> <laughs> he's very intimidating looking. So when, as he's going out, I said, Nicholas, here's a taser, son. <laughs> I have a taser, and I gave him a taser that looks like a cell phone. And I said, if he does anything, hold it to his neck, push the button, and hold it till it dies or he dies, whether one of them. <laughs> and that's a true story. And he never had to use it. And so they were staying with Kirk. And so Kirk is very attached to my kids. He's been around them since they've been little and stuff. And so he's like, what in the world are you doing letting her go down to this? He said, I'll let Ethan go down there and, and shadow them while they're at the park. And I was like, and I'll pay a salary. How about that? I'll take care of that too. Way overprotective, Dad. So you're like, yeah, Heather, try one of those Christian dating sites where you meet up with somebody. You have no idea if they're real. And then they lure you in and then they kidnap you. Okay, that's what you ought to do. <laughs> That's, the, you know, if I was in my right mind, that's why I said it had to be the Holy Ghost that done it. Anyway, we don't talk about this again for a long time. So one day beginning at the beginning of COVID, around about April sometimes, she's, she's home after they've sent all the kids home from virtual learning. She says, hey, I'm talking to a guy. I said, really? And she said, you're never going to believe this. So in Heather's words, they had, this is what she told me. They found each other on one of those Christian dating sites. They swiped each other. I have no idea what this is. I've never been on one. They swipe on each other. I'm married, and I better never be on one. They swiped each other. And she said they started talking, and they've not stopped talking since. And this is what she told me this week. They have swiped on each other, started talking that day, and haven't quit since. So she told me that uh, she was talking to him and, and, and everything, and she was telling him, hey, tell him a little bit about each other, and said, I go, just texting and stuff, and said, I go to Radford University. And he says, oh, really? I got a friend that just moved back home from Tennessee to Radford. And so they're sitting there jibber-jabbering back and forth, and somehow the guy's name comes up, Wesley Combs. 
And she says, Wesley Combs, Brother Junior, you know Wesley Combs? Yeah, yeah, I, I went to church with Wesley Combs. I, I, and it ended up she knew Cindy, and she knew Todd Coke, and she, he, or he did. He knew Cindy, and he knew Todd Coke, and he knew Chloe and all of them. And so, you know, they come to him, and, and so they're talking about this. And, of course, I call Wesley. Wesley, give me the down low on this guy. Tell me about what this guy's like. Yeah. And he said, yeah, like he was calling me. He said, hey, I'm talking to your youth leaders daughter and Wes is like what are you talking about you're talking to my youth leader's daughter he said yeah I'm talking to Heather Bailey he's like how in the world do you know Heather Bailey and so he told him about the whole connection so Wesley's telling me yeah he's a really good guy goes to church is is, is faithful to church is, is a worshiper he's he's just a really good guy and I said okay that's fine what's Catherine think <laughs> I want to know what your wife thinks it's not that I don't trust you Wesley it's just that I don't trust you Wesley <laughs> Now, Wesley was the best man in the wedding, so they were really good friends. But So I said, I want to know what Catherine thinks. So this is the Catherine, he said, Catherine, what do you think about Heather and Joseph getting together? And she's like, oh, yeah, they'd make a real nice couple. And I was like, whoa, whoa no, 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 no. They're just talking. We're not talking couples. We're not talking dating. They're just swiping each other and talking and texting backwards and forth. And you're talking a couple, slow your roll, cool your jets, whatever it is that you want to call. We ain't talking going that far yet. And now a little over a year later, they're married. A little bit over a year. So when we first met Joseph, he had come up and, and, and I had told Brenda from the moment, I've told lots of people this, from the moment we met him, there was this weird peace. And the only thing I can say, it's the peace that passes all understanding. That's the only way I can express what the peace that I had when I met him for the first time. This is my daughter. This is my only daughter. I'm not going to have any more. When I would ride with David and David would be driving fast, what would I tell you, Heather? David, you got Heather Nick's favorite dad in here. You better slow it down, you know. That's my only daughter, my favorite daughter, the number one daughter that I have, and I'm protective, very protective of her. But I had this peace about it, and it was, had to be the peace that passed all understanding. And I felt completely comfortable about it, and I had no idea why. It had to be God. It had to be something. And so he was getting ready to leave, and I was like, well, we better put the Piedmont prayer on you. I, maybe I shouldn't have, but we did put the Piedmont prayer. I don't know if I want him to come back or not. <laughs> Just kidding, Joseph, if you ever listen to this. But we're praying, and I'm putting the Piedmont prayer praying the Piedmont prayer over him. And so when we get done, I hug him and I say, I love you. First time I've ever met him. And I looked at Brenda after he's, I was like, why did I say that? <laughs> I told him I love him quicker than Heather said I love you. And the only thing that I can think is what it was, what it was God saying, it's okay, let me handle it. God saying, let me handle it, it's my affair. And it wasn't because of me, and it wasn't because of my fear. It wasn't because of my relationship. It was because of Heather's relationship. Amen. It was Heather's relationship with God that brought this up. Her. her relationship, her dedication to the Lord, her life. Is she perfect? Nope, not hardly. And none of us are here this morning. But she loves the Lord. She had a true love of the Lord. She wanted to serve the Lord. She had a desire to do something for the Lord. And she had a desire to work for the Lord. And his God reciprocated that to her. He returned that love to her. His thoughts toward us, toward everybody here this morning. God's thoughts toward you this morning are thoughts of peace and not evil. God wants to bring peace into your life. God wants to bring you to an expected place this morning. Not an unexpected ending. Not an, God has an expected place that he wants you to end up a journey that God has placed you on, that he wants to put you in to the end. A desire to have peace. He wants to bring you to that expected ending in your life. And Heather had put her faith, her trust in God, had allowed God to be the rudder of her life and to lead and guide her in the direction that she went and God was bringing her to an end in her life getting ready to bring her in to another start to bring her into another end in chapter 10 of Acts we have one of the the most important stories that you're going to find in the Bible for us for us non-Jews this is one of the most important stories that we're going to find in the Bible it's the story of Cornelius 
a Roman centurion, a man of war, a man that was the boss of a thousand Roman. He had a thousand Roman soldiers. We got 77 people in here. Multiply that by 13, 14. That's how many Roman soldiers he was over. That's how many. Matthew Henry said about this story, he said, we do well to pay attention to the story of Cornelius because he was the first Gentile. God chose Cornelius as the first Gentile to, the, the first Gentile to bring salvation to, to bring the Holy Ghost to. He is the first documented Gentile in the Bible to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Something that surprised not only him, but it surprised the Jews that was with him that day. Peter and all the others, when they saw them filled with the Holy Ghost, it just blew their mind. Because in their mind, there was no way that a Gentile, somebody like us, could be saved. To the Jews, even though they were under the rule of the Romans, they considered the Romans dogs. They considered them second-class people. They considered them somebody that could never be a servant of God, a, a, a somebody that could be saved. And when the people in Jerusalem had heard that Peter had preached to these Gentiles, their first res response was not, yeah. You know, if we heard that God went down to, to Africa and saved thousands, or he went to Bland, Rocky Gap, and there was a revival and there was thousands of people, man, we, yeah, God, that's, you, could say, you could say them people in Bland even. Hallelujah, yeah. I'm from Rocky Gap, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> School-wise, I guess you could say. But the, you know, what, his first response wasn't glory. The, wasn't their first response wasn't glory to God or, or thank God he can save anybody. No, it was something much worse. Acts 11, chapter 2, verse 3. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. They kind of argued with him, saying, Thou wentest in with this man who's uncircumcised? And you ate with him? Forget preaching the, whole, uh, preaching the gospel. Forget baptizing them in Jesus' name. Forget they received the Holy Ghost. You ate with them? I mean, that's all these guys. These were people that had the Holy Ghost. These were people that, that maybe may have walked. Some of these people may have walked with Jesus, and yet their eyes were so completely closed to the, the, the plan of God. They thought that they were the only ones going to heaven, and they couldn't see that God had it in store for everybody. But in chapter, three, verse, or chapter 10, verse 3, the Bible said that Cornelius saw in a vision an angel of the Lord coming to him and called out his name. And Cornelius responded, you know, what is it, Lord? What do you want? And he knew enough about God, his relationship. He had a relationship with God. He had a relationship close enough with God that he knew something was going on. Yes, he was afraid, but he still wanted to know what it was. God, what is it that you want me to do? Cornelius, what, yes, God, what do you want me to do? What, he, he was opening himself up to, you hear the voice of the Lord when, when he said, what is it, God? What do you want me to do, God? What path do you want me to walk? What, what, what is it do you have in store for me today, God? What's your plan? That's what we should, when we come into the, every morning you get up of a morning, God, what do you have in store for me, God? Where do you want me to walk? Who do you want me to talk to? Where do you want me to go, God? What is it that you want me to be acceptable? Put yourself in a position where God can bless you and put you on the path that he wants you on. Amen. He wasn't frightened by it. He was not scared by it. He was interested in what God had in store for him, and he wanted that from God. He showed, and he showed that by the life that he lived because he was so close to God. God, you know, do you, do you, this morning, do you want something from God? Where do you want, what do you want from God? What is it that you want? You know, if, if, in, if I told you, if God said, you know, Brother John, an angel comes to John, John, and you said, what is it, Lord? I've got the winning lottery numbers. <laughs> yes, Lord. Well, we'd be all in for that, wouldn't we? But what if they said, Brother John, yes, Lord, I've got the power to lay hands on the sick, and they recover. What if I say, John, I want you to be, oh, that's good too, but who wants, some people, you want the responsibility that comes up with that. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. John, do you want that? John, do you want to be a missionary? John, do you want to be a pastor? Do you want to be, do you want to be something in the church? John, what is it you want to be? Yeah, we want the good stuff. We want the stuff that we want. We want the lottery, but do you want to do a work for God? Are you willing to put yourself in a position where God can say, yes, I'm going to use you? Maybe God, all he wants you to do is live a life in front of your family and live it consistently day in and day out every day so that he see, they, they see what it takes to be a saint, what it takes to be saved, what it takes to be faithful to God, and that you are faithful to him in everything. 
a people that live, a person, maybe God just simply wants us to live a life so that other people see us. Oh, it can't be that simple. Most of the time it is that simple because he don't call everybody to be a pastor or a singer or whatever it else. Do you still want those things though? The angel said something to Cornelius that we should all strive for in verse 4. He said, your prayers and your alms, the gifts that you have given to the poor, the prayers that you have prayed before God, the kindness that you have shown to those that are around you, they've come up before as a memorial before God. The things that you have done for God, God has been placing them in that bucket that Sister Judy used to talk about. And as the bucket began to fill up and began to fill her fuller and fuller and fuller, God would see it and he was, got to a point where it's full and all of a sudden says, God says, I'm going to pour a blessing back on, on Cornelius. I see all the prayers and I see all the things that Cornelius has done in my name and in in the goodness that's in his heart. I see every prayer that he's prayed and all of a sudden God says, you know what, I want to do something with him. I, I've got a plan for you, Cornelius. I, I want to pour out a blessing to you, Cornelius. I've got something planned for you as that bucket. Everything that you do for God just goes in that bucket and it just continues to get fuller and fuller. And God was bringing him to an expected end. God was bringing him to an ending of uh, ending in his life, that he a place in his life where God expected him to go to. Verse 5, he said, the angel says, send men to Joppa. There you're going to find Simon. Verse 6 says, he's going to, you're going to go down there and he's going to tell you what you ought to do. What's in your best interest to do. And when you come to the church and you hear preaching messages and you hear teaching messages, the pastor and whoever it is, they're giving you something. It's out of the word of God. It's some things that you ought to do. <laughs> it's some things that's really in your best interest. There's things that come out of this pulpit that comes out of the Bible. It comes out of the men that God speaks to. It's really some things that you ought to do this morning. It's some things, Brother Clarence, that we ought to do in our life. Thomas was talking about worship. We ought to worship. It's in your best interest to worship. It's in your best interest to clap. It's in your best interest to get your hands up before the Lord. It's in your best interest to get a little bit excited once in a while for God. It's really in your best interest to do that. It's not in your best interest to sit like this. It's really not. Because <laughs> God sits there and thinks, all the things I've given to them, and that's all I get? That's all I get for all the blessings and all the healings and all the things I've done. And this, maybe one bad thing happens and they're not going, Wah. and that's all I get? That's all you give me? It's in your best interest to worship this morning. It's in your best interest to pray. It's in your best interest to fast. He sends men down there, and God is already preparing Peter's heart. He's already preparing because Peter had the same prejudices in his heart toward the Romans, toward Gentiles, as those people that we talked about earlier that he went down to Jerusalem and talked about. Unclean, unsavable. And thank God, thank God that God doesn't save people because of the way we see them because of the way that we look at them, because we got prejudices in our life because of social, economic, whatever, color, race, whatever it might be. We might have some kind of prejudice in our life because of what they look like or where they come from or they're strung out on drugs or they're alcoholics or they're wife beaters or whatever it might be. We look at them, they can't be saved, they're unclean. People in our own family, and you might even have that same feeling about yourself this morning, that there's no way I can be saved. Yes, there is a way that you can be saved because there was blood that was shed. There was blood that was shed. There was a price that was paid to bring salvation to even somebody like old Dwayne. Somebody as filthy stinking as Dwayne is, Dwayne was. God was bringing an expected end to Peter's prejudices. God expected those prejudices eventually to end. Peter, you got to get over this, son. I, there's something else. There's something that you don't know what's going on. I ain't going to get into that. Peter goes back and he preaches the gospel to Cornelius and to his family and friends. And Cornelius had invited all of his close family and all of his friends into the house. And they're saying, guys, listen, listen here. God sent me an angel. God sent an angel and he's going to tell me what I need to do. You know, I've lived what I know all this time, but there's evidently something else that I've got to do. There's something more than, than what I've been doing that I have to do. Guys, come on. I want my whole family. 
And that's the way we need to be doing with our families. Guys, uh, I'm going to church this morning. The pastor, the preacher is going to preach something that's going to be in my best interest. It's in your best interest to come too. It's in your best interest that you should come on with me and you should show up down at the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ about 9 o'clock on Sunday or 8 o'clock, not 10 o'clock. Well, you ought to just come on about 9 o'clock and pray a little bit maybe. But 10 o'clock on Sunday. You can't just stay home and expect God to tell you what to do. Cornelius needed a man. Cornelius needed a man of God to tell him what to do. And Peter told him, and he tells him about Jesus. He preached the death, the burial, the resurrection. He preached as he preached, and as they were preaching, as Peter was preaching to them, the Bible said that the Holy Ghost was poured out on them. Acts chapter 10, 44 through 48. And while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished because of what they saw and what they, they heard something, they saw something that they didn't never see before. They, these people, they'd never seen this happen to the Gentiles. They had seen it happen to the, to the Jews, but never to the Gentiles because that as, as Peter uh, as many as, as came with Peter, all these people came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues. And that was the gift of the Holy Ghost. You received the Holy Ghost, you had to speak in tongues to show for people to be astonished and say, oh, you got the Holy Ghost. Oh, you're speaking in tongues. That's the, the, that's the sign. That is the evidence of speaking in tongues. And magnifying God and then answered Peter, can any man... Well, now we got water. Can we? Be, any man forbid water that these should be not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they to tarry them a certain day. Salvation came to the Gentiles because they had already repented, was living for God. Now they had baptism, and now they had the infilling of the Holy Ghost, just like the Jews did, speaking in other tongues and all the other stuff that comes along with having the Holy Ghost. Cornelius was a good, just side note, this ain't my note, but Cornelius was a good man. He prayed, he'd done all this stuff, but he didn't have the Holy Ghost. He hadn't spoken in tongues. He hadn't been baptized in Jesus' name. He had to do, here's what, it's in your best interest. This is what you ought to do, Cornelius. You ought to go get baptized in Jesus' name. You ought to receive the Holy Ghost. I know you may not believe in it, but maybe you ought to speak in some tongues, Cornelius. Mm. It's the truth. That's, here's what you ought to do, Cornelius. It's in your best interest. He preached to them and they received the Holy Ghost. And these were the first Gentiles that were recorded in the Bible, receiving the Holy Ghost, the power of God and the salvation. Cornelius had served God, again, the best that he could, the best he knew. But God was now bringing an end to that. <laughs> Bringing an end to just doing the best I can to doing the best that you can. I was just doing the best that I can do, but now he's bringing him an end to. He's bringing an end to the idea that the Gentiles can't bring. He's bringing an expected end to the idea that the Gentiles can't be saved. There is salvation not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles and everybody else and throughout the world. As many as the Lord God, our God, uh, the Lord our God, shall call, bringing him to knowing what to do. So God has a plan for our lives this morning. God has a plan for everybody in here. Everybody in here, God has a plan. He has an expected end that God ex wants for you to live, a place, a plan that he wants you to live. Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected an end. Expected here means the thing that God longs for. <laughs> God longs for us to have an, the ending that he has in store for us. God longs for that. God says, I want Dwayne, I want Tammy, I want Brother Steve and Sister Sue. I want them to have this ending. Here's what I want for them. I long, God longs for us to have the expected ending that he has for us in our lives. He longs for me to be where he wants me to be. He longs for you to be where he wants you to be. Whether it's comfortable or not, that don't matter. This is where God wants me to be. His thoughts, his actions, everything that God does is towards me. It is for my best interest. 
It is for a peaceful purpose, a purpose with an ending that God longs for in our lives. There's some things in our lives that God brings wants to bring to an end in our lives. There are some things that are going on in our life, like with Peter and his prejudices. God says, that needs to come to an end. Peter, that needs to come to an end. You need to get rid of that. It's time for you to see past that, son. There's more than just Jew. There's Gentile. Every man is the same in the eyes of the Lord. It don't matter where you come from, what color you are, no matter man, woman, whatever. All that matters is that there is a soul there that needs saved. God longs for us to bring God longs for those things to come to an end in our lives. The road that God had Heather planned for was not the same road that Dwayne had planned for. Brother Clarence, did you plan on the boys moving out and moving to Radford? I didn't plan on Heather going to Tennessee. I had no plan. That was not in my book. I don't have the book with me. I didn't have a book. I really didn't have one. But God wanted to bring an end to her her, her, her loneliness. God wanted to bring an end to her being by herself. But she had to be willing to give up a perfect job. Art teacher at the high school, at the local high, the perfect, she said when she got it, that's the perfect job, Dad. That's the perfect job for me. I can work and then I can do my arts and stuff that I want to do on the side and do things that I want to do. But she had to be willing to give that up. She had to be willing to, to leave the place that she wanted to spend the rest of her life we had went over the hill there to where uh, Saford and them grew up, and she just fell in love with that house, uh, the little house over there on the back side where, well, I can't remember her name, Miss yeah, Brenda and all them, that's where they grew up, whatever. And she's like, I want to buy this place, Dad. I want, can you check in for me for, to buy this? And what's, we had planned on looking for that. She had planned on staying there. Giving up where she wants, giving up her church, the church she loved, giving up seeing at her church with her, with her mom, with her dad, her family, with all the people that she loves that she's grown up with. She had to be willing to give all that, to bring that to an end, to get to the end that God wanted her to be at. God says, if you want an end to your loneliness, if you want an end to this, you got to end something else. You got to bring something else to an end. And sometimes we look at those things that happen in our lives, we can look at that. I can say, oh, that's, man, that's horrible. I don't want Heather to leave, and I didn't want her to leave. I don't. No, her house, yeah, her room was messy. And, uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> but God has allowed things to happen for a reason. And that reason may be just to bring an end to things in our lives, to get us on the road to the end that he really wants it, the expected end that he wants us to get to. He wants things to end in our lives so he can get us to that expected end he wants us to. Think of Hannah. Hannah was a woman in the Bible who was barren. Okay, she couldn't have children. And there was another woman in the picture, Brenda, Paniah, Paniah, Paniah. Well, I'm not going to do it like Tom said. I'm going to go with what Brenda says. The other wife, the, here was the other wife, and she had children. And so she would go and she would provoke it and she would pro- flaunt it in front of Hannah and say, look at my children. Look here, I've got my kids, so just follow me here. Where's your children at? And she would provoke her to get sad and get upset. And finally she went to the house of the Lord and she cried on the altar. And the Bible said that she was bitterness, she had bitterness of soul. She had been, she was so upset and so bothered by the fact that she was barren. She got down to the altar and she got busy with connecting with God. She got busy with connecting with God and she made a vow unto God and said, God, if you would give me a man child, I'll give that man child to you. If you let me have a boy, God, if you'll let me have a boy, I'll give that boy to you. And by the same time next year, she had a son. She had a son, a boy named Samuel, who would eventually be the last judge of Israel and would be the first prophet of Israel. God had had an end that he had longed for Hannah. He had longed for her barrenness to end. But he had to get her into a position where she got serious enough with God where she would make a vow to God because God needed Samuel. God needed a Samuel, and he needed somebody that was willing to provide him a Samuel. So he had to put her in a position where she would do whatever it took For him to get whatever he needed. (laughs) It seemed bad for Hannah. It was hard on her. And I'm sure she couldn't see why that happened. But God needed her to make that vow. He needed her to dedicate that child to him so that he would have that prophet. And because she kept her vow to God, the Bible says she had three more sons and two more daughters. 
That was the path that God chose. That was the exp- that's the e- end that God longed for for Hannah. I want you to have s- six children. One of them's going to belong to me. <laughs> I want you to have six. I want you to have four boys. I want you to have two. And that was the end that God longed for. But if she had not made the vow, she would have never had the child. And if she had never kept the vow, she would have never got the other five. If she, You can make the vow, oh God, and then God bless you. But if you don't keep the vow, don't expect the further blessings from that. If you don't keep that vow, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then God blesses you. And then you go back on it. You just ended it. That's not God's, God's expected end went way past that. But you just brought it to an end yourself. That's not the end that God expected. He might have anticipated it. God anticipates it sometimes because he knows how we are as humans. But that's not the end that God expected. He wanted her to go way past just having the one. He wanted her to have six. But because of her, her keeping that vow... And I know that kind of sounds kind of harsh, but that was the plan of God for her life. And when she submitted to God's plans, the thoughts that he had toward her, those thoughts of peace, the not evil, could then be put into motion to bring her to that expected end. I didn't like the thought of Heather going to Tennessee. I did not like it one bit. I'd much rather have her living there close. You know, I done said he's got a commitment to the police force down there. Uh, that, you know, he's got a three-year commitment, and, you know, to get out of it, you have to get out of the contract, you have to do $4,000. I was like, well, Dad won't be able to come up with $4,000 if something comes up here and y'all move back. I'll figure, I'll sell something, I don't care. To get them, that's how bad I want it. And you know how, oh, God, that's how bad God wants us. God wants us. He gave his own life. He gave his only son. He, he came down in flesh and gave his life. If I do that for Heather, what in the, if I give up this spin out cash out of my pocket to get her back, what in the world would God do to get us to the end that he expects? That's the end I expect for her to be here with me. It may not be God, so. I'm not sure how many nights that Heather spent up feeling sad. I'm not sure how many nights she spent uh, praying and how, much she, how serious she was, but I know she did. I know she prayed about it. And I know it wasn't something that she was going to walk into lightly. That's why she, 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 she wanted to have that Mr. Right. But because she prayed and because she waited for God to move, God heard her and God answered the prayer. It wasn't maybe not in her time. It wasn't in Dad's time. It wasn't in Dad's place sometimes. But it was in God's time. It's when he wanted. And if moving to Tennessee was part of, of his plan and she submitted to it, No matter how much it might hurt for me and Brenda for her to be away, I know that she's where God wants her to be and that God is going to bless her. And God is going to continue as long as she keeps her part of it, that that expected end that God is putting her toward, like Hannah having that extra five. If she hadn't kept that vow, and she had never kept that vow, she never would have had those extra children. But because Heather, because Hannah, because if I, because if you, if I keep that vow, if I tell God, God, I'm going to do this, if I'm going to serve you, I'm going to give, through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clap when I come to church. I'm going to worship when I come to church. I'm going to get happy. I'm going to thank God. I'm going to pray over our food. Whatever it is that I say, I'm going to do for God. And some things that God tells us that even we need to do. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, we'll read it again. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. Then, then you'll call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, your whole heart. When Hannah got serious about finding God, she found him. When she had determined in her mind, I'm not backing up, I'm not backing down, I'm not turning around, I am going to live for God, I am going to do whatever it is that God wants me to do so I can have this child, so I can have this man child, then she found God. And I go back to that story about Matthew Henry. We ought to pay attention to the story of Cornelius. We really ought to pay attention to what, what was it that, that about Cornelius that God said, I need somebody to pour out the Holy Ghost on for the first time to the Gentiles. Who am I going to, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Who am I going to choose? And Cornelius, he looked at Cornelius and said, that's a man I can use right there. That's a man that I want to go down in history. That's a man I want to be written about in Acts, the chapter 10 of Acts. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 and 2 said, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. 
It said he was a devout man. It said he was one that feared God with all of his house. He gave, and he gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. <laughs> he was always praying to God. He was a devout man. He was dutiful. He, he was committed and devoted to God. As much as he was committed to being a centurion, here he was a, a rough and tough centurion Roman soldier over top, over, over, being the boss over a thousand other, other soldiers. He had to be tougher and rougher than all of them. He still felt more of a duty to be a servant of God than he did a centurion. He felt more of a duty to be a servant of God. This said that he feared God. He feared God, and, and, I, and sometimes we need to have an afraid fear of God. We need to be afraid. We need to be afraid of the rock falling on us. We need to fall on the rock and don't have some fear about you. You better serve God so the rock don't fall on you. But his fear was a respectful fear of God. He had a reverent fear of God. He was, even though he was that rough, tough gruff Roman soldier, he still feared God. Amen. He wasn't afraid to go into battle, but he feared, you know, he wasn't afraid of man, throw up the sword, throw up the shield, whatever. But he feared God enough that he respectful God, respected God and was respectful of God. It said that he had taught his whole house. He had his whole house fearing God. He spread the gospel. He spread, not the gospel at that time, but he had spread the news about God. He shut, lived his life in front of them the whole time. His wife, his kids, and everybody else in there thought like he did because of the way he lived it. Everybody in his house feared God. They had the exact same reverence and respect for God because he was the man of God in the house. He was the spiritual head of the household, and he spread that idea of we need to fear God. We need to live for God. We need to serve God in with the rest of the household, every one of them. That's why you men, you people that's got kids or you granddads, y'all better be setting the tone and the tempo for the house that you live in spiritually. You better lay it down and say, this is it. we are going to fear God. We're going to serve God as for me and my house. And you women that don't might not, have, you women that might not have a husband, or if your husband ain't here, you better set the tone for him too. You better tell him, "I'm serving God. I'm going to church. I'm going to do this, no matter what." He was fear God, and most important of all, though, it said that he prayed always, always. He was always in prayer. He was always trying to get in touch with God. He didn't even know who God was, but he was always trying to get in touch with Him, and because he sought God. God, he found God. That last scripture, Jeremiah 29, 13, if you would, I'm closing the musicians. Come, please. He said, you shall seek me and find me when you will search for, for me with all your heart. What is God's expected end for you today? What is God's expected end for us today? What does God bring, the ending that God has for us? And if you don't follow God, if you don't live for God, where does your road end when you don't have him? If you don't have God in your life, where's your road going to end up? I've heard Brother Jerry say so many times, better not give up your seat in the church, ain't it, Brother Jerry? Better not give up your seat, the one that God's made for you. And I'm not necessarily talking about the bench. I'm talking about the path that God has created for you in your life. You better not leave it. And if you give it up, if you turn for God, I'm not sure where you're in to be. But if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, his thoughts toward us are thoughts of peace. Our thoughts are not evil to bring us to an expected end. But what does God long to bring to an end in our lives to bring us to the end that he wants for us? Do we have suffering? Does God long for that suffering to end? Does God long? Do you have pain? Do you have sadness? Do you have loneliness? Do you have faithlessness? Do you have worry? Do you have doubt? Do you have disillusion? Do you have a feeling that I'm unworthy? Do you have a, a feeling that I'm unsavable? God wants that to end today. God wants every one of those to end right now. God, God longs, God does not, his thoughts toward us are peace. God's thoughts toward us are good. He wants us to have those. And that's what God expects for us. But we have to get into a place sometimes where we are willing to God, whatever it takes, God, I'm going to get it. That I'm going to seek him with my whole heart so that I can find you, God. He longs for us to be in a place that he has made especially for us. And it's a place we can finally find 
when we have our hearts toward him. Hannah went to the house of God and prayed at the altar. She got down on the altar and it said that she, had, she was in despair. She wanted that child. She wanted to bring an end to that loneliness so much she jumped on the altar. And Cornelius, a devout man who prayed, he just wanted to find out what God wanted for him in his life. God, where do you want me? God, what is it that you want? What do you want me to do? And God has that exact same things for us. His thoughts are all positive. I know we got this idea, that, and I've said it before, that we think that God's up there. He's wanting to pound, 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 pound. And sometimes we have, that's the devil talking to us. Because there are times that God does want to get on to us. But he died for us, didn't he, Brother Clarence? He died for us, and God has nothing but positive thoughts toward us. He has nothing but love and forgiveness and mercy. Heaven is full of love. It's full of forgiveness. It's full of mercy, and he wants to pour that out on us. And this morning... The altar, is right, the, the, the altar is the best place to make that change, to end that part of your life so you can get to that expected end that God has for you. And if you haven't found him, if you haven't found him, all you got to do is seek, with, seek him, seek with him your entire heart. And if you seek with him, you'll find him and he'll bring you to your expected end. Pastor.